Good morning. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. I have with me this morning Reggie Middleton, founder and CEO of Veritasium, and also what was once a very popular boom uh, blog, the Boom Bus blog. Welcome, Reggie. Thank you very much. I say once popular in that I don't think you're actively updating it anymore, correct? I'm not actively updating Boom Bus blog, but I still write analysis on current events. A uh, slightly different take on the blog of my new venture, which is Veritasium. And that's uh, and that site is 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 called Veritasium or Bloom Boom Bust. Veritasium.com. Okay. Veritas, like the Latin truth. Mm -hmm. B U M dot com. Go to analysis, and you see just as much controversial stuff there as you saw before. Reggie, for for our listeners who aren't familiar with uh, with yourself. Could you just give them a quick overview of the background, your involvements, and what's led to this particular venture? Okay, um, quick, quick, uh, over, uh, quick recap. Uh, I'm a full-time father and stay-at-home dad. Uh, I've always been an entrepreneur. Um, I tried corporate America nine months out of college. It didn't work out for either corporate America or myself. So I had a few entrepreneurial uh, pursuits, dot-com, financial advisory, insurance, risk management. And each pursuit gave me a background in that particular business or profession. Um, after the dot com, I took a break. Then I went into investing in real estate, small income producing properties in gentrifying areas. At the same time, we had the credit bubble forming. Um, gentrification plus credit bubble meant you know, significant gains, outsized profits. Of course, when two plus two starts to equal seven, one should be selling versus buying. I figured that out. I'm not that good at math, but. You know, I didn't know what two plus two equal, but I figured out it was a seven. So from 2000, I was buying properties, building a portfolio. At 2005, 2006, I started selling off. Um, the second half of 2006, first half of 2007, the New York markets collapsed. And um, right before it collapsed and I was selling off the properties, I said, I want access to that um, extreme leverage that hedge funds get because I want to short everybody who ever did business with me. Um, because I realized, you know, the shenanigans that were going on. So I went to start a hedge fund. At that time, the hedge fund was actually in a cyclical peak itself. But at, con comp con at the same time as starting a hedge fund, I decided to market myself. I couldn't market the blog itself through the SEC rules. So I went to market myself because I didn't come from the stereotypical background. I wasn't off the Goldman Sachs uh, prop desk. I wasn't from Harvard Business School, etc. So I created Boom Bus Blog. Um, just to give my opinion. Uh, it became rather popular and people were getting rather belligerent, you know, demanding my opinion at two in the morning, you know, for a free blog, which I think is, you know, a bit grassy of them. So the best way to get somebody to leave you alone is what? You ask them for money, right? So I put a paywall up, total silence. I took a break and three days later, Morgan Stanley called, said, if we wire you $10,000, which you turn three of our traders on. <laughs> Sounds like a deal. And that's how Boombo's blog got started as a revenue generating um, advisory. Mm -hmm. um, that was many years until I caught the Bitcoin bug. Um, not necessarily Bitcoin bug, but the Bitcoin technology bug. The technology behind um, Bitcoin and its blockchain is a phenomenal invention. And, and I actually dropped the advisory business, which was successful, and went on to that. During the seven years of doing advisory, I called the fall of Bear Stearns, the fall of Lehman Brothers, the housing crash, the commercial real estate crash, the European sovereign debt debacle, um, comment on Deutsche Bank, the whole European banking you know, situation. I called uh, Portugal, Ireland. Just for our listeners that may not be familiar, um, I was following Reggie's site at that point in time, and he's 100% right. He called absolutely every one of those things and it wasn't just speculation reggie the detail and the analysis that you had done the thoroughness with the team that you had put together was uh it was there was nobody in the public domain that had anything even close to it so it wasn't just a lucky guess you you had it down to three decimal points at the time i just need to i need to say that uh that 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 you have every right to be very proud uh, uh, during that particular uh, period of time that's why i wanted to talk to you today um, is your feelings and views on the European banking system because clearly there's problems today. We're seeing it most noticeably in Deutsche Bank. I don't believe the, any of the problems were ever fixed. They only got worse. 
but I remember years ago you felt that the leverage in the banks was upwards of north of 55 to 1 and Lehman failed at 32 to 1 and it's probably worse today. Your views, your comments on what you think is going on in the European banking system. Okay, well let me start off with this disclaimer. Um, since I um, engage in a new startup, I don't keep abreast of the current events of the European banking system um, from an advisory or fundamental perspective. But um, I'm actually looking to disintermediate banks, so I'm still quite familiar with the business model. This is a problem with Deutsche Bank and the European banking system. The problems from 2006, 7, 8, 9 are the exact problems we have now. You know, instead of fixing the problems, they attempted to uh, save profligate investors and spenders, papering over it with what I've called the great macro experiment, the great global macro experiment. They've done things they never did before. Um, negative interest rates, massive QE, um, you know, just experimenting. And the issue with that is some of the things were done before, such as QE, which was invented by the Japanese. And there's a decent history of uh, the success rate of QE. I think QE, the Japanese have been doing QE for about 32 to 34 years. If you remember, there was a lost decade in the 1980s. Well, that's lost three decades now. Three decades and change of QE, and Japan still hasn't successfully jump-started their system. They're still fighting deflation. The exact same problem they were fighting when they instituted QE in the 80s. This is how it works. We have a bubble, and a bubble is defined as when prices shoot above the fundamental value of what is being priced and the bubble pops and instead of trying to allow for a true fundamental reset of prices and values everybody wants to shoot and raise the values i mean i'm sorry raise the prices so instead of allowing prices and values to reach an equilibrium when prices drop they're trying to push your prices back up now even if you succeed you know it's value that benefits people it's value that makes an economy run so when the prices go up i could do a demonstration this is uh, for people who don't get it. Here, I have a cap. So when prices go up, come right back down because you need value to keep the prices elevated. That's a very simple demonstration. Um, most pre-K kindergartners get it, but central bankers don't. So, <laughs> and, and the thing is, they do get it, but they believe, I think, that if they push the problem out long enough, they can export their deflation and their... Um, economic woes to neighboring countries, but it's a global economy now. You may succeed in exporting short term, but if, if Japan succeeds in exporting its issues to the EU, it makes the EU sick. Mm -hmm. The EU is a major trading partner with Japan. The EU attempts to export to China. China it tends to export to the US. The US exports to everybody. And, you know, you have a circle jerk. Um, you're going to have a massive reset one way or the other. So it's going to be a collapse short drop, or it's going to be gradual over 35, 40 years, as Japan can attest to. And that seems to be what we're, we're on a, a descending glide path, and the problems just get worse until potentially something breaks and really puts us into a crisis, but we don't really, we really, we don't really know. Now, uh, what, you mentioned blockchain as a technology, and I think it's a, it's a technology that actually is going to revolutionize a lot of different uh, industry, specifically the banking. Comments there? Yeah, well, um, for those who don't know what the blockchain is, uh, the blockchain is basically Bitcoin recast with a different name because Bitcoin has a negative connotation because of the media. You know, we have a new technology and instead of um, um, expounding on the virtues of new technology, they expound on whatever sells eyeballs and impressions. So drug dealers, rapists, whatever. But Bitcoin's technology, underlying technology, is basically a new way of doing uh, database work. It's a database that's distributed amongst uh, many, many individuals. Uh, instead of having a single database, say from IBM or Oracle, you have a database that's run by three million machines, each share a copy of the database, a full copy, and each get the vote on the veracity and the truthfulness of the transactions in that database. With that much horsepower calculating database, and that many eyes looking at whether each transaction is true, you have a system that cannot be taken down by um, a single authority. Um, even multiple authorities take an uh, extra hash of computing power, which is like a thousand Googles, if Google could take its entire computing power and focus it on one problem. 
which is unlikely. And if you could do that, you need a thousand of them, which you only have one. Um, this type of security is monumental. In addition, it solves something called the Byzantine general problem or the double spend problem, where you could take a digital object, like a digital dollar, and you could spend it in Southern Europe. But somebody in Rhode Island could try and spend that same digital dollar. Previously, with the old database technology, they could spend the dollar twice because there's no way to verify whether that dollar was spent or not. Using blockchain technology, you cannot double spend. So one dot digital dollar is always going to be one digital dollar, and it can't be cheated unless you bring that one exit hash, 1,000 Googles focusing all their computing power on one problem. In doing that, now you can create transactions where one individual could do business with another individual without knowing them, without trusting them, or without getting a loss of credit, counterparty risk, etc. This is monumental. What makes this monumental is the fact that the entire financial industry, or the vast majority of it, the profits and fees are based upon being an intermediary. You can't do business with that guy because you don't know how, it's not safe, you don't know who he is, etc. So we're going, to, we're going to stand in the middle and we're going to take a fee. Oftentimes, they don't give a calculation on how the fees are calculated. So the fees are monumental, which is why if you go to Wall Street, the buildings are big, the cars are fancy, the boats are long, the bonuses are large. Um, I'm a capitalist, there's nothing wrong with making money, but now you can cut that entire portion of the transaction out and do business directly, peer to peer. In doing that, you have the ability to cut friction down to near zero, cut costs down to near zero, increase transparency to near 100, and simplicity to itself. This is a sea change in the way banking is done because now banks are forced to add value to the equation or they'll be disintermediated. But disintermediating means meaning removing the middleman. Um, those who don't add value, uh, what uh, the economic term for it is called rent seeking. And rent seeking is not uh, a landlord going to a tenant and say, give me money at the end of the month. Rent seeking is an entity that extracts compensation from a transaction without giving back the requisite value. So those middlemen or intermediaries that don't add value are eventually going to be cut out of the equation. Those that do add value are going to be needed, and so they'll be there. No matter how low transaction costs are, if you add value, not only do people want you there, that chances are they may need you there. But a lot of the banking transactions, particularly with friction-free transactions, which we call pathogenic finance, an, outrage, an outrageously illuminating report that can be downloaded from the Veritasium site, um, pathogenic finance is basically the phenomenon when this friction-free transaction becomes viral. And it spreads through banking, finance, insurance, risk management, real estate, healthcare, privacy, information technology, etc. When the world realizes we can deal directly with each other, it's just like the world realizing, hey, um, I don't have to buy a fax machine and send a fax, I can send an email. Look how that changed the world. Or, hey, I don't have to rely on this 200-year-old media company for information, which is so source and usually quite biased. I can go to this internet protocol-driven platform, which is the internet, and I can get everybody's opinion. And I could give my own opinion and spread it out to as many people as have an internet connection. Well, the Bitcoin platform is the exact same thing. As a matter of fact, it's run the exact same way. You know, Bitcoin is a protocol-driven platform, BP, the Bitcoin protocol. The internet is a protocol-driven platform, IP, the internet protocol. So when you think of Bitcoin, don't think of actual Bitcoins because those are just uh, a technical term. Think of a, a myriad platform of which you can paint a tapestry of various um, applications, just like the internet. The big Bitcoin platform now and blockchain technology now is analogous to the internet in 1993, where most people didn't get it. When they did get it, they thought of the internet as email or FTP, file transfer protocol. Fast forward, let's do the math, right? 10, 20, 30 years, something like that later. Now you have Facebook, YouTube, Google, Google Voice, all these myriad applications, so much more than email. Just like Bitcoin and the blockchain technology, it's so much more than actual digital currency. It's a way of transferring value. Um, one quick analogy, two quick analogies. Um, one is our prototype platform, which is value trading. Um, you can go download the software, put your Bitcoin in it, and you could trade any of 45,000 tickets, any asset class, any geographic exchange or boss all around the world with anybody else. Counterparty risk 
free and credit is free. You cannot break the contract, you cannot remake, you will always get paid. It's mathematically driven. Um, stocks, bonds, equities, metals, um, derivatives, indices, etc. That's one application of many that we're working on. We're all going to start in real estate as well. Um, we're creating something analogous to a trade net. Um, we give this as an example. Imagine you're driving in your car. Everybody has an internet connected car, either in the car built in or through a cell phone. And you are a high net worth individual. You're stuck in traffic. You want to get to your destination. Or you're a middle class guy and you just really want to get to work on time. You go through and you make a bid to pay people to move out of your way. Okay, and they accept that bid. So you say, I'll pay up to $2 a car for the next 30 cars to move out of the way. That gives you uh, up to $60. They start bidding at one penny, just like in eBay, and works their way up to your maximum bid. And then the cars start moving out the way if they accept the bid. You actually buy your way through traffic in real time um, with a peer-to-peer -peer auction. That's an example of what this blockchain system can do. You know, peer-to-peer -peer transactions, that car scenario, no middleman necessary. No auction, no government, no bank, no broker. The same scenario with the peer-to-peer -peer, um, value transaction with stocks, bonds, etc. No exchange needed, no broker needed, no bank, no Merrill Lynch, no Goldman Sachs. There, I just, there's an excellent job of describing it, Reggie. I really appreciate you taking the time there. Many things jump out of just how revolutionary this is and what it could make a difference of. You mentioned no counterparty risk. The change, really, it's reinventing, I'll use the term contract law, but relationships that are solid and independent and unknowing of, of another person. But it uh, also springs into the fact with, with, with banking. You've, you've now got this point where it's totally independent globally. I mean, that's what I should say. So there's no, you use the term regime uh, control. There's no regime like a country that can tax it or restrict it because it's operating completely globally. That in itself is very powerful. If you want to be independent of a banking system of regulatories, et cetera. Am I right in that, in that observation? Technologically, yes. Um, certain, sm certain strong regimes, such as the US, uh, say Germany, um, Britain, can put pressures on the end users and on the access points, um, the in and out points, to uh, break it or attempt to break it. Of course, that's a lot easier said than done. Um, the U.S. attempted to uh, attack and break peer-to-peer -peer file sharing with um, Pirate Bay, etc. Um, they were able to take down Napster because Napster was a centralized system where Napster had a server, people put files on the server, and then would download them. Um, that was a weak point, and there's also a lot of illegal things were happening. We're breaking U.S. law. Well, I want to be clear on that. So the U.S. government confiscated Napster's servers and said it was illegal. Um, a new technology came out, peer-to-peer, -peer, where instead of having one hub, and a lot of people go to the hub to send and receive files, you have millions of hubs, and each hub is self-contained, and the files are sent in a big web directly to each other. Now you have to take several main users out or more, and if you leave just two nodes, then they start building again automatically, sort of uh, organically. They grow. That is impossible to take down by force. So the government and the lawyers for the entities who felt they were being deprived, um, that's a mm -hmm. different conversation whether they were or they weren't, but the law was broken. They used the courts and legal means to try to take down the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, as to how successful that was, if you take a look at music industry revenues, 75% drop from the time of the popularity of MP3s to present. And um, there are several studies that say up to 65% of download traffic comes from peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. 65% of download traffic on a public internet, not including dark web. So you've outlawed something, you've attempted to take it down, and it is the most prolific use of the public internet possible. I think that's an absolute failure. The reason they failed is when you have a new technology, when you have a paradigm shift, right, you embrace the paradigm shift. You cannot take the technology um, genie and stuff it back in the bottle. I mean, if you remember when I was a kid, I used to watch Bugs Bunny, and there was a particular episode where Daffy Duck met a genie, and uh, the, the genie found gold with Bugs Bunny, and he tried to take Bugs Bunny, he said, mine, 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 and stuffed Bugs Bunny into a bottle. That works well in a cartoon. In reality, 
stuffing technology in a bo bottle means you simply get left by the technological way. And it happens time and time again. There's literally thousands of years of evidence. Um, if you go back over the last few decades, you know, IBM used to run computing um, with mainframes and mini computers and microcomputers, then Microsoft took over, and then Microsoft ran the PC age up into the internet age. They survived the paradigm shift in the internet age. I think they were the first company to survive being on top of two paradigm shifts, but the antitrust issues slowed them down, and then the internet age truly took off, and Microsoft is a relative has-been uh, compared to Google's and compared to Apple. Now, Microsoft's been surviving because they have patents and they simply make money from everybody who uses things. But each paradigm shift, Microsoft did not fight it. You know, they embraced it, which is why they survived too. Every company that fought it, think of Amiga, think of AOL, which tried to be the gatekeeper for the internet versus embracing the internet. You know, they fell to the wayside. Um, AOL is a perfect example of how technology works and how the banking system will play out as I see it. The banks are taking the Bitcoin technology and trying to use it to retrofit um, efficiencies into their legacy and antiquated backends. Massive undertaking. It will make a lot of stuff faster, but at the same time, you don't need banks in general for transactions anymore. So no matter how much more efficient banks are, if you don't need them, the efficiency is going to the wayside. Think of a brand new Ferrari engine. Brand new technology, 2016, whatever it is, or Lamborghini Aventador, since I'm familiar with that. You take that engine, you take it out, you try and retrofit it to a horseshoe to make the horse run faster. Well, a difficult undertaking, and even if you succeed, you have limited success versus just taking the Lamborghini and driving off. That's what the banking industry is trying to do, and in doing that, they're following an AOL route, where AOL took the internet technology, dumped it down, tried to make themselves a gatekeeper, and funnel everybody through AOL into the internet, but they were in their wall guard. One day, somebody woke up and said, hey, you could go straight to the internet. You have to go through AOL. You don't need that. You've got mail. And that's when AOL took a downfall. And I expect the same thing to happen to the banking industry. If I'm correct, the banking industry is going to come in for hard times. Number one, you had a cyclical high. Um, you know, the banking industry has booms and busts. Um, where the trading revenues you know, are high, trading revenues are low, investment banking revenues are high or low. You had a cyclical high, you're on a downturn. You have a lot of global macro issues. You have you know, the global macro experiment, which heretofore has failed. And if I'm correct, you have a structural high where the banking industry has changed. Margins, no matter how well run, are going to be slimmer because now there's so much more that could be done without banks. Add all this together with the um, regulatory changes, where banks have to hold significantly more capital. And now the business that banks had just weren't as profitable as before. The big mega bank business model is expensive, you know, and you have to break banks into smaller, more nimble models. But if you do that, then you have to compete. Then you don't have the synergy where you just run over all the entrepreneurs and small regional banks, national banks, etc. So add all this together. I could be wrong about two or three things, which I don't think I am, but let's assume I am wrong. You still have massive headwinds against banks. And then there's the legacy issues from 2008, 2009. Derivative risk concentration, outrageous. You know, you said that you, um, earlier before the show, we had a conversation about Deutsche Bank, whether it has problems. That's not really the way it works. If Deutsche Bank has a problem, the banking system has a problem. Deutsche Bank has a trillion dollars on balance sheet at a minimum. You know, there's that old adage, um, if, you know, for the... Um, for the um, real estate developers, they say, well, if I owe a bank $500,000 and I default, I have a problem. If I owe a bank $500 million and I default, the bank has a problem. And that's basically where we are right now. You know, Deutsche Bank apparently has a problem, according to the rumor reel, and a little objective uh, investigation. If Deutsche Bank has a problem, you know, you best believe that Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, their major counterparties have a problem. And 92 percent of the derivative risk in the world is shared by about six banks and I think it's now five. And what are those five? Uh, let's go through. We had Citibank, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, and Bank of America. And which one? I haven't checked recently. No, no. I, I, good. I was getting to which one disappeared off your original list. That's what I was grappling with there. The the, the first list was pre-Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Okay. And this is another point. 
in the original list because the problem was that banks were too big to fail. Um, Bernanke initially wanted the banks to fail, and when he was when he was approached with uh, um, the prospect of saving the banks, you know, from what I understand, you know, the rumor mill, he said, "You're out of your mind. You know, you take public risk, you fail, you fail." But they somehow convinced him that the whole banking system will go down because he allowed Lehman to fail. And then he had the money market liquidity issues. And, um, you know, I guess he was scared everything was going to blow up. Um, I still don't believe in that. Um, banks have been failing for 2,000 some odd years. The sun has rose every single day since. Um, and it will rise again. The concentration issue is a problem. Banks shouldn't be allowed to get that big with a government backdrop. You know, if you charge the correct risk premium for capital, a bank could never get big enough to take down the world because it couldn't afford to attract the capital to take that risk. You know, once you price, if I can get um, money at 75 basis points, then I'll take all the risk in the world. And if I mess up, I don't have to pay the 75 basis points. I get bailed out. There's no reason not to take risk. But if I had to pay 18, 25% for that money, it's not worth taking it. I wouldn't engage in these businesses and the risk never um, appears. So bring back true fundamental market analysis um, actual natural market economics, and I think it solves itself. That means, though, the guys who messed up have to fail. Reggie, back back to the whole blockchain, and you know, you're living in this. If I can use that term, you're living in this every day with your new new enterprise. How fast is it moving, and when are we going to see applications and and uh, tools that people can really use? Besides what we see on the surface at Bitgold and Bitcoin and this this set of application sets, how big is it? How fast is it moving? And how many players do you see? Well, there are a lot of players. There are a lot of players now. You can't tell how many because now the institutions have their own working groups and they're internal. Um, I can tell you where our timeline is. We had the first functional digital swap. Um, the swap first settled in December 2013. Um, it's been running since in the public domain. You could go download software now and actually do a swap with the trade. Um, we work, the things that we are working on, I'll give you rough timelines. We're creating an HTML client that allows you to hold your assets in your device, on your phone, your computer, your tablet, your full assets as a web page, fully secure. That's like having a bank account on a web page that sits on your device that cannot be stolen unless it's stolen from you directly. Um, that's monumental. So that means no applying for accounts, et cetera. A web page is your entire bank account. That is by the end of the quarter, we should have that out. So month after March. Um, <laughs> knock on wood, fingers crossed. Uh, we were the first to file um, applications for the application of cap application of capital of blockchain technology to capital markets. Um, that's peer-to-peer um, -peer swaps, um, letters of credit, et cetera. We plan to have the letter of credit, the peer-to-peer -peer swaps, and an application to real estate transactions. Um, hopefully, in beta around mid-year, definitely by year-end um, funding committee. Um, that means that we can take entire buildings and put them on the blockchain. Um, there, are, there are legal issues. But we can actually go past the legal issues by putting actual cash flows on a blockchain. So, you know, moving title to a blockchain, you might need the agreement. You might have some precedent issues. But we can actually move entire cash flows. So someone buys a building and they can split it up. Five-year cash flows, the building go this way, air rights go that way. Underlying, you know, mortgage to the, prop, the whole development project deed. We can split it up and we can make um, basically a new way of financing with it. Capital quotas come in, we can blur the line of equity and debt, and now we can eliminate banks. We can say, listen, we can give an all equity deal, but we can give uh, the attributes of a mortgage deal without having to worry about the bank blocking the more creative ways of doing things because banks want that first lien position. And we can take that first lien position, make it mobile, and it can be moved back and forth with capital stack, sold off to the highest bidder, et cetera. And most of all, we can make a default free contract using small contracts where the fraud is eliminated. And uh, once you're in there, everything's verified, the deal is done. And that's where we have the legal issues because a small contract is self-executing and self-enforcing. 
You cannot break it. A legal contract can be broken, and that's the issue. So if a judge makes a judgment and says, you have to give that money back, well, the contract's not going to listen to it. So. Reggie, we have to, we have to break now. We're up against our, our hard line. Could you uh, thank thank you very very much here? Could you tell our listeners how they could follow these developments, the things that you're doing, um, and and how do they, could they invest in you? Um, you can invest in me. I'm actually looking for a round of investment. Uh, credit investors actually best ways to uh, um, approach me and talk to me. I can be reached via Twitter at Reggie Middleton. Um, via email, Reggie at Veritasium.com. That's VeritasEUM.com. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook. I'm very easy to get. You can just Google who is Reggie Middleton. I'm all over the place. Um, we're looking for, I am actually want to make this all inclusive. So you have the regular credit investor route, uh, which is self-explanatory to the credit investors. But I want to open up to the regular mom and pop as well, which I think according to recent crowdfunding and uh, uh, equity crowdfunding laws and SEC changes is possible. So we're going through the appropriate routes, routes for each endeavor, and I welcome all in all to please contact me this talk. Reggie, thank you very much for today. I wish you all the success. I, I have a feeling you're going to be very, very successful here uh, with this whole enterprise, and we have to have you back and talk further during the course of the year. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reggie. I appreciate it.